It actually goes both ways. Like some people who work on stuff, I feel like there's this thing of like, everything should be beautifully made and lasts forever and yes, but actually I don't think that every object you own, you have to keep forever and commit to for the rest of your life. And you have to live in like a museum that looks like architectural digest and everything costs, you know, no, actually some things move into your life and move out of them. The key is that if they move into your life and into a, out of your life and into a landfill, that's the problem. <laughs> you have to share them with other people and build that circularity in. But I feel like we need to have the part of a healthy relationship is, is, as you said, an attachment and appreciation of the things around us on the one hand, objects that are well made that can last a long time, and an understanding that there can be a flow of objects through our homes and through our lives and back out into somebody else's home and life, and that that's part of it too. <laughs> Sandra Goldmark is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Sandra is the founder of Fix Up, formerly Pop Up Repair, an innovative social enterprise in New York City. She is also a theater set costume designer, a leader in the field of sustainable theatrical design and director of the Sustainability and Climate Action Program and associate professor of professional practice at Bernard College. She has an AB in American Literature from Harvard College and an MFA in Theatrical Design from Yale University. In her book that I have right here, Fixation, <laughs> How to Have Stuff Without Breaking the Planet, uh, which was published in uh, 2020, September 2020, um, Sandra Goldmark calls on us all to move beyond our throwaway culture by rethinking how we shop and what we value and to incentivize companies to produce better, easily repairable goods that really are in desperate need from some of us to be fixed, to be repaired instead of thrown away. Sandra adapts a simple motto from the food movement that has profound implement implementations have good stuff, not too much, mostly reclaimed, care for it, and pass it on. Sandra, it's so good to have you here on the show. Thank you for making it. Hi, thank you for having me. It's so great. I, you, you've got a busy schedule, and you're, you're doing a lot of things at Bernard College, and, and you're in New York, and all, all sorts of busy things going on in these crazy times that we're living through. So I really value your time to connect with me and talk about your book. Um, we, we could talk for hours because there's not only, uh, as I just teased in, in your quote here at the end of your biography, um, a lot of things to do with food and Michael Pollan or connections to, to that as well, as well as one of my mentors, uh, um, William Bill McDonough from Cradle to Cradle and Michiel Braungart, who actually lives in Hamburg. He lives a little bit outside of Hamburg and and has the cradle to cradle uh, office right across from the uh, Hamburg parliament. And uh, you mentioned them a lot in your book as well. Um, you've been doing this for a while. So obviously you got into it in kind of a, what some people might say is a roundabout way, theater, you know, uh, uh, and design, things like that. And now it's, it's almost got this overarching sustainability fixation theme. And so my question with all this experience, all this educating and teaching people um, in different ways where you kind of touch on these subjects, how in the hell have you weathered this pandemic, this crazy time, Black Lives Matters, the inauguration, uh, all the social distancing in relation to what you do, not only teaching, but in the book fixation and that, has any of that given you resilience to, to get through these crazy times or have you been hard hit yourself? Um, yeah, let's start with a big question then. Yeah. <laughs> the, <it's, laughs> the, the, this year has been in some ways for me difficult in the sense that it has been for everybody that, um, you know, it's been a really crazy year. But on the other hand, I feel very lucky that for me personally and my family, we've been okay. I'm very conscious of that. We, we, 
we did we did get COVID. My husband and I got COVID early in the pandemic in March here in New York. Um, but it was okay, you know, it wasn't too bad. And in some strange way, having had it early at, at the very least removed some of the anxiety for us. Um, and while it's been like, as for many people, you know, to have your sort of regular routine upended, there have been, first of all, we have not, you know, um, we have jobs, we haven't lost anyone close to us. So I, we count ourselves very lucky. And on the other, there have been some strange things that have been quite nice. Like, while it's difficult to work with children shouting and jumping in the background, it's it's nice to have extra time with them. Um, we spent a lot more time uh, in New York State this summer than we do normally, and really because we couldn't go anywhere, and 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 that was wonderful. And and on a bigger level, it has been like in terms of work. You know, people ask me like, oh, do you see, you know, you work on consumption. Do you feel like the pandemic is helping people consume less or better? And frankly, the answer is no, but, um, or at least in America, but, and maybe we'll talk about that. But I do think this, this sort of terrible slowdown and pause is definitely an opportunity for reflection or a forced reflection. And I do think in terms of climate change, I do think that the conversation is shifting and that is maybe the most important thing. So maybe that's the, I don't, I hesitate to say silver lining, but the, you know, the, the new growth that might, or the new, you know, like the little flower that might grow from the winter. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. The, the, your, your book also was released September 22nd to 2020. So right at the, the, the middle of the pandemic. So, I mean, uh, I don't know if you have other experiences with other book launches or release. You have a fabulous publisher, Island Press. So, so that uh, they're, they're great to work with, but I mean, that's also something that's kind of uh, different. Now you're not doing like book signings or tours or, or going anywhere or, or, or that it's all online. And, and <laughs> How did you how did you feel about that? Was that like a kind of a weird experience or was that also okay? Well, luckily this was my first book, so I didn't have anything to compare it to. <laughs> so I thought this is great. And also um, I had secretly, but you know, before the pandemic, I had secretly thought, oh my God, am I gonna have to like fly all over the place for this book about sustainability? And I thought maybe I need to sort of rent a little electric car and drive. You know, I couldn't quite imagine flying all over the place to talk about a book about sustainability. I mean, this sort of hypocrisy just seemed kind of insurmountable. So that was good in the end. And I think probably um, it's not a good time to publish a book maybe during a pandemic, especially if it's, you know, not about something sort of critical, mission critical at the at the time. But um, but it is what it is. And, and I I'm happy to have been able to talk to so many people all over the world without, you know, without traveling. So maybe, maybe think, another silver I, lining. <laughs> yeah, a more effective use of, of your time, more efficiency. I mean, I, I used to travel a lot as well. And I spent most of the time in airplanes, taxis, hotel rooms, in and out. And, and it's just kind of very shallow, not a lot of depth and substance. And it's very quick. You never kind of really get a have that interaction with people and this is kind of more efficient of time and sometimes we can make those those good connections um just just to, for for my listeners and and for you as well there's when i was in elementary and in junior high school i was on the drama team the stage crew and uh, uh theater team where i did the lighting and the sounds and did the set design well obviously with a, with a, a teacher who who was in charge of us and uh, kind of giving us direction for the specific plays or the programs that we would do, um, and um, so I I I I get it when I read your book and hear a little bit about how how you came to this how you kind of have to uh, out of necessity find ways to to create a set to on on the stage of a theater you've got to make it look like a house or a city or whatever type of environment and you really have to, you don't have in some, especially in elementary and 
junior high, you don't have very big budgets. So you're pretty much a scrappy. I remember going to that. We had this area called uh, the pit and it was like a big dumpster people. It was just the old people go dump their trucks there, all their garbage. And we just, it wasn't a dump yard, but we'd go there and grab all the scraps we could get it and then build it up at the school. Um, but I, I really love, I, I have to tell you, I, I'm so glad I have the physical copy. I also got the digital copy. I read it a couple times and I love it. It's such a good book. Um, there are so many great references. There's so many down to earth. It's an easy, uh, fun read and you make it very personal. I feel like I know your husband and your children and, and uh, kind of your experiences and um, I've had some of those same crazy experiences with my families where I said, you know, in, in the first of your book, you, you, you kind of talk about with your husband say, we should write Walmart a letter and your husband kind of, oh, yeah, oh, I, the way I read it, it's almost reels you in or says, okay, well, maybe that might not be possible or okay, let's, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, so I, I, I love that. The question really is, do you feel like you are a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders and divisions of humanity, one from another, related to your book, your theories on fixation on this whole stage crew, design Bernard College now you might probably be teaching online and those things do and your ties to sustainability do you think those are some of the issues we're dealing with today it's funny that you put that sort of super small universe of the theater right next to a, an idea of like a, a world without borders because on the one hand that might seem like a kind of crazy juxtaposition like how does how does a question get from like oh you designed scenery to like let's talk about the whole planet but I like that um, juxtaposition because there's you know as you said I come from this theater background right I just made scenery all through high school and college and I went to grad school for it and I just sort of designed and made these little worlds with with theater people and one of the amazing things about theater is it is like a little world like a little universe sometimes to a fault like you kind of shut yourself in this dark room and you don't eat and nobody sleeps properly and it's like and you kind of forget the outside world and the show you know the show has to go on um so and you've got everything in that little world you know you've got the actors you've got politics you have um people who sweep the stage and people who strut around, you know, feeling very important and everything in between. And um, you've got stuff, you know, you make stuff, you have a, a, a very clear process for how you make decisions and how you, um, how that little universe operates, you know what I mean, that you're making. Um, and the scale of it is very human. I think this is one of the reasons a lot of people in, in, in school at all levels really love theater. First of all, it's creative, it's fun, but there's a scale to it that I think we as humans kind of understand instinctively. It's a group of like, you know, 10 to 50 people. It's a little hunter gatherer size group. Um, and everybody really matters. Like if that person does not sweep the stage and doesn't push the, the you know, push the, the button to turn the light on at the right time, like the show is screwed. <laughs> and so even though there are sort of hierarchies and importance, there's a real sense when theater is going properly that we all matter. And there's also a sense that within a certain structure, we're inventing this world, we're creating this world together and we have a creative process. And so, and the role of scenery within that the first thing is, you know, that people think of, as you said, is like um, uh, location, right? Like, are we in a city or in a castle? I think you said, but there's a layer to design within theater that is actually about meaning. And it's about setting up the rules of this world. Like when I walk in as an audience member, is this a, is this a world, there's a writer named Dennis Kennedy who writes beautifully about this, where he calls it the thematic signifiers, which sounds sort of like, I think, academic speak, but what it means is that you walk in and you understand, oh, 
this is a world where this happens, where this is important, um, where people speak like this, where um, I understand the emotional quality of this experience before before anything happens, just because of the music that's playing or the visuals I see. So for me, the, the role of the designer in the theater is to help create that, that tone, that world. And especially for my part of design, thinking about the physical objects that occupy it. So the way for me that translate into like this big jump of like a world without borders is I think funnily enough, as I've started thinking about and working on questions far beyond theater, far beyond design, I, I have to lean really heavily on my work on my many years in the theater because like that's all I've got, you know? And so I look to some of the ways we make decisions. Not that theater's all perfect, good and bad, you know? Some of the ways that we are, um, as you said, scrappy and resourceful and kind of the original circular economy and some of the ways that we're very wasteful and some of the ways that we value each person on the team and some of the ways that we don't and some of the ways that our labor is not fairly compensated. And so I think there are analogies to much broader scale human endeavors in terms of thinking about what are the rules of the world we're creating? We have this incredible creative capacity as humans. So how, do we, how are we gonna design that world in a way that is beautiful and fair and regenerative how are we gonna think about the material objects that we make and create and, and have them communicate a meaning that's really the meaning we want to say? And how are we going to value the labor of all of the people in our little, in our little made up world? Um, and, um, and really uh, make sure that that it's in alignment, that if we think we're telling a story of a healthy planet or a regenerative society, um, that we're not saying one thing with our words and doing another with our physical actions or our social um, actions, like, you know, the way we pay people or the way we credit them for their work. Anyway, that's, that's how I might draw a little tenuous line between you and there, your dumpster and me and the, and the big wide world. There's a, absolutely no, no anyway, because you, you, I'm, I'm so glad that, that uh, we're aligned and you were able to draw those connections because they are so real. And that's why I brought them up because um, there's an enormous amount of diversity in, in the theater and that whole stage crew of theatrical environment, the way from, from every aspect, every job or role or even audience, not only the audiences from, you know, uh, back back in my situation was much different that you're at a different level, obviously, and, and have experiences than, than I had way back then, uh, elementary, junior high, but grandparents and people of color and different cultures and different times of the year, you know, and uh, I, I, I would even remember times when we would do some kind of a Christmas theme where uh, I was like, well, what about the Jewish people? What about Muslim? What about all these others? You know, um, uh, so I guess this is only a select audience and, and how does that work with the student students and, and, and that and so, but also where I was getting scraps and things of someone's rest to, to, to build in that, but there's that much bigger connection where not only are we cr very creative in, in that process, or you are very creative in, in what you design for the theater, you're creating this new world, but the only way you have to draw on that experience is from the stories or the history of the real world that you've experienced somewhere else. And, and it really is one that doesn't function well with social distancing, borders, division of humanity, one from another. It tells a different type of story, and it's one that always ends in, in something negative, a collapse or destruct. There's usually not a lot of positive stories in that respect where it's okay. Because of that, then we, we moved on to this much more desirable, better future. It's one that kind of prolificates into something more negative and 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 harmful down the road. And so, um, and this kind of ties to, to where we're gonna touch a little bit on, on food and things and also on business is um, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, air, water, food, we're all global citizens, didn't see nations, borders, divisions, didn't stop in, in most cases. Um, 
and the pandemic was very exponential. It didn't also stop at borders and nations. And, and it really, uh, it would have spread regardless of air travel, regardless of sh ship travel, probably in a 10 to 15 day period anywhere, just because of the airflows uh, of our world and the pollution that we have going on in our world. Um, but it was exponential because of our air travel. And so I, I wanted to get your views on, on that thought process because currently our world's civilization frameworks have a lot of us human beings at, at dis ease, one with another, one with our politics. They're kind of saying this civilization framework's not working for us anymore. It's uh, not representing me. And um, in, in your book, you specifically get into this a um, couple, couple ways. You, you, you mentioned uh, companies like Apple and Ikea and, and uh, built-in obsolescence. And then you also touch upon um, some great wisdoms from Michael Pollan and, and his food wisdoms and, and things and how that's relate, related to the built environment. But those are very global operations. Those are very big operations. Um, for that. And so I, I, I wanted to get your take because I, I have that feeling as well. The question really is, I get the sense that it's not about the brands of the future, the products of the future. It's about how we produce any product, manufacture it, and make those products that really can reduce not only obsolescence, but also um, human suffering and solve our global grand challenges more so than it is this is a sustainable brand you know oh, apple yeah. or pantagonia or whatever and i wanted to get your feelings on is there a more tangible term or way of looking at that that because i we tend to get caught up in this all oh, the brands of the future that are real sustainable is this and this well it's not it's about how you produce that's kind of my opinion mm -hmm. i want to get your views on that totally i mean i think the it's definitely not about the products of the future. There's no pr single product that's going to do it. But there might be a product that's made by a brand of the future. And the brand of the future are the brands that are building, I guess you might call it like the systems of the future. Or maybe it's the systems of the past. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, um, I don't know that these systems are really so new, the ones that we really need to, um, to build out. In fact, they're probably very ancient and all around us in the natural world. Innovation to me, there's this, um, David Sachs has this op-ed called End the Innovation Obsession, where he talks about the concept of rear view innovation and not thinking of innovative products or brands or systems as something that's like, whoa, you know, surprise, but more things that, um, especially now, um, as we're facing um, such big challenges, things that that look to what has worked in the past or what works in nature. So I guess for me, like the big challenge for brands is to build, um, for me, it really boils down to like building a system that uh, it's, a, it's about circularity, plain and simple, right? We have a linear system right now most companies' business models are totally built on a linear system where they extract materials from the earth, make them, sell them, and then they basically go into landfill, pretty much. And so to me, the whole like path forward is to think in, about circular systems. This is where you mentioned cradle to cradle, but like um, a very, very simply what that means is that you have to create a business model that isn't built on that, that isn't built on always selling more new objects, but that has revenue that comes from some new objects that are made in a different way, that comes from re, uh, reuse, business model built on repair, service upgrade. So that little Michael Pollan kind of adapted, adapted tagline that you mentioned of have good stuff, not too much. That's really all about circularity and it applies at every level. It applies to an individual who's thinking, how, how should I shop? Like, what is a sustainable brand? Or a business that's trying to say, either trying to be responsible or frankly, trying to survive in the kind of coming years. And also to policymakers to say, how can we kind of scale and support building these systems globally? So I guess, yeah, for me, a sustainable brand is one that is really 
really looking at building a regenerative circular system for how they work. And that means their business model. I guess this is probably a point where we can, where we can get into um, this individual action versus political or bigger actions. There's a lot of debate back and forth or I mean, almost confusion where, you know, it's all, oh, it's the consumer's responsibility or it's the individual or I'm too small to do anything. And um, there are some things that tie to the bigger circularity and with, you know, Ellen MacArthur foundation, big circular econ economy, but the, the, the other economy that you were also talking about is that it's really, it's a, an extractive, an extractive economy, which is very destructive. It's cradle to grave. It's got an end. It just piles up. Um, what, what are some of the things that in, in the U S or your other discussions around, what are you seeing the confusion between this individual action or I'm too small or this bigger political or production point of view on, on, on that? Well, I see, I feel like there's a, a weird discussion or conversation happening right now that I feel like often sort of almost like pits individual action against some people say systemic change or um, some people like to talk about policy changes or some people like to really port, point to the you know, kind of corporate responsibility. And for me, I just don't see these as opposed. I don't see it as an either or. And in fact, I see both as completely necessary. I don't think we're going to get systemic change without a whole lot of individuals changing their individual actions. At the same time, I think that um, corporations and policymakers have a much higher level of responsibility to make those changes um, in their systems, right? Which are big systems within the larger system, right? What's a corporation? It's a system within a larger system. What's my household? It's a very small system within a nest of larger, larger, larger systems. So, and what am I? I'm a little system in my household, in my city, in my country, connected with all these corporations. To me, they're all connected. They're all one system. And so um, every single part of the system needs to shift. So if you're sitting around, if you're a corporation and you're sitting around and saying, well, the, cons the individual consumers, there's no, ind there's no demand. So I can't make these changes. Then, you know, that's BS. You can, because sometimes you can take an, if you build it, they will come model. And also the demand is there, which we can talk about later. <laughs> if you're an individual and you're sitting around and being like, well, it doesn't matter what I do. Um, uh, you know, we just need, we just need system change. Well, you're part of the system that that would like be a, like a leaf on a tree being like, well, I don't care what the, what the tree trunk does. I'm just gonna, you know, I'll do my own thing. It's ridiculous. You're totally connected to the larger organism, to the larger system. And those, you know, changes come from the top down, but they also come from the bottom up. And in fact, they really work when they go together. So sometimes people say like, oh, the most important thing you can do is vote. Like, yes, if it's an either or, if you have a choice between, if, if you only do one thing all year and it's vote or, you know, change your personal shopping habits, please vote. But I don't think that's how human beings work. I do lots of things all day long. <laughs> and in fact, the things that I do all day long, the things I do in my household, the things I do in my community, the things I talk about with my um, people in my organization where I work, those inform how I vote. Those inform how my neighbors vote. That informs how my children will vote. That informs whether people vote. So for me, the, the debate or the discussion of like, to say individual actions don't matter to me is idiotic because you might as well tell me not to vote, right? It's this, that's, that's an individual action. It's just one at my vote. And frankly, it's true. If I don't vote next election, it doesn't matter, but it does. Because as soon as you say that, every single person can say, well, I'm just going to sit this one out. And yeah. it's also like, you know, anyway, so I think it's, it's, um, I think it's a false debate. I think it, it disempowers people. And I think it gets into a sort of um, weird spiral, yeah, side <laughs> thing that is sort of, Michael. it's not useful. So I think it's, 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 it's everything. It's, it's, um, we're all in it at every level. 
inaction is also uh, can be very slippery slope. So in that just inaction mm -hmm. or saying I'm too small to do anything or I'm going to set this one out. Um, it is an action in, in and of itself because you're you're giving um, way to someone else to deliver uh, the future to you or futures to you um, by by in, having that in action and there is is so we really touched upon a few things right one out of the shoe. Go ahead. One more ahead. thing though about that individual action thing that I do think I do want to acknowledge and understand is like the plastic bag example for me is a great example of where you can get into some sort of BS on all fronts. <laughs> like when you go into a store um, and there's a little plastic bag and it says, please recycle. That's where you're like, okay, all of this is ridiculous <laughs> because that bag shouldn't be there. The, the, the store should not be putting this bag that can't be recycled and then asking me, the individual, to like magically somehow on my own, like recycle this bag that can't be recycled and shouldn't have been made in the first place. So I wanna be clear that I'm not saying like, you know, you know, for those of us like me sort of who've been dutifully saving and trying to not take our bags and bringing our canvas bag, like we do need the, um, the kind of system, you know, corporate thing of being like, no, that's bullshit. You can't just stick that bag in the store and, and say, please recycle individual consumer and think that we're at all gonna solve the problem that way. At the same time, those individuals who dutifully bring their canvas bag to the sea town every week are actually sort of helping lay the groundwork for the bag ban that eventually gets passed by city council. If you don't have those sort of early adopters and those individuals saying, actually, it's possible to bring my canvas bag and then, you know, encouraging their neighbors to do it. And then finally you get the bag ba bill passed. Um, and then other people are like, I guess I can do this too. I can, I, it, so it's like, there's a relationship between these and, and you need to sort of acknowledge the role of all of them. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that it's-, it's No, that, that's so important. There's also a form of an infrastructure that needs to be there or support from community cities, uh, 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 organizations that make that, can give that convenience aspect so that it's easier to do the right thing. That There's not even that option really there. And it's, um, when it comes to human nature, it's usually we default for the convenient aspect. If we're hungry, we do what's the most quickest and, and convenient. We don't think about all these other bags and, and, and choices that we need to make along the way. Right. Um, and, but in some respects, to go back to what we were speaking just a tad bit before there is this systemic thinking. Everything in our world systems, you said it was so eloquently, um, and we try to dumb, dumb things down. We're like, give me this, the TED talk or the simple answer, the short version, the elevator pitch. Those don't solve our global grand challenges. Don't fix these complex things. And then if you understand all these systems, no matter how small, they're all inter in, in, uh, intertwined with, with one another in, in the bigger system. We're working most of them autonomously every single day. It's okay to embrace that complexity and say, yeah, every day mm -hmm. I get up, I breathe, I eat, I sleep, I do all these other things that gets me through it. But that's multiple systems working uh, almost gooey autonomous, autonomously every single day. So embrace that complexity and say, oh, no, I can, I can definitely do it. There was for me in your book, an aha moment, which um, I want you to break down for me. In here, you said that w with your repairs and your fixing of products, you also started kind of a questionnaire with people where you would ask them, you know, are you doing this because it's sustainable or for the environment or the earth? And for me, the responses you receive were like, yeah, that makes sense. But it's also kind of shocking because you think, no, they're doing it because they're sustainable. And, and the result was actually something total different. Can you kind of give us more insight into that and what those questionnaires over time told you and what, what, what learnings you had from that? Yeah, they, so we asked, we thought, I, we came into running these repair shops um, 
with such a kind of green crusader uh, spirit, like, like, well, that, you know, no more blenders to landfill. And, um, and we assumed that all of our customers were doing the same thing, that they were fixing their blenders to, to save the planet or to reduce waste or whatever. And, but we did a little survey and we found out that they, they all said, you know, it was like one, something like one to 10, did you come here for yourself or to save the planet or reduce waste? Everyone said, I came here for myself. Um, and everybody said that they did it because they wanted that specific object to work. And it was really interesting. At first I was disappointed. I was like, oh my God, we're doomed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, you know, and, and then I thought, well, let, let's like look at this a little closer. And they were all happy to reduce waste and happy to, you know, help save the planet or whatever. But it was really interesting that they, they all, it was really like this particular object, they just wanted it to work. And the, the sort of waste reduction was, was definitely a bonus. But more importantly, what I realized was the waste reduction wasn't even that, even that wasn't so altruistic. It was more like that a lot of them felt a lot of guilt about chucking the broken thing because they felt like it was kind of perfectly good and it felt wasteful. So even the waste reduction thing was a little bit of like a selfish thing of like, oh, I feel guilty dumping this printer, but, but look, this repair shop owner told me that it can't be fixed. So now I can, I can like, you know, recycle it or whatever. And and it made me realize that like, it's just a different conversation. It's not, we're never gonna sort of all altruistically, I guess, sort of say like, we're gonna do the right thing or save the planet, but, but we can build these pathways to where those behaviors are easier for people because actually they do want them and they do feel good for people. If you can make it feel, if you can make it not too hard because people are busy. People are working really hard. People have, you know, kids, they have two jobs, they have whatever. So like I wound up feeling hopeful in the end because I realized, you know, it's really all focusing in this case on these stuff. Like they have these attachments to these objects. And at first I thought this is crazy. And then I thought, wait a minute, no, it's like, that attachment, that connection is actually valuable and powerful and can weirdly wind up if we build the right system with like the right answer, the right action. Does that make any sense? It, it totally makes, it goes back to actually what we were talking about on, on how you produce and, and this, this, this if, if it doesn't have built-in obsolescence, it's something that you, it becomes part of your culture, your family as a tool to your life that you can have forever the, the I, I don't know how well this relates but there's a section in your book as well where you i don't know if it was with your kids you were at an event where you're talking about um, what's the original tool you know and, mm -hmm. and it's basically a rock and 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 how people didn't take their you know uh, the original neanderthals or whoever the the and i'll let you describe it better than i do uh, have a rock they didn't carry their rocks from one city or one place of uh, uh, the world to another they just found another rock where they're going and as over time we've kind of got in this uh, every tool everything that i pick up i've got to keep and i've got to keep it forever and carry it around with me I'd like you to tell me a little bit more about that story if you don't mind so now you're getting into like this question of humans and stuff which i feel like yeah. i got so interested in in writing this book because i feel like I feel like it's a little bit under recognized in, in some people's daily lives, like how important this topic is. Like if you look around you, anyone, whoever is listening right now, I guarantee you look around yourself and there is stuff all around you. Like even if you're backpacking in the middle of, you know, Yukon territory, you're wearing clothes, you've got tools, you've hopefully got a tent, like, and most likely you're sitting in a home or an office, literally surrounded by man-made or human-made objects. Like this is how we live. It is totally central to our species. Um, and even if you look way back um, or at societies that today have much less numerical objects, like a less volume of objects, we still as humans 
we have and we make tools and make things with those tools. Like it's as important as food, as cooked food. We can't survive without it. It's as important as language. It's one of the defining things of our species. So actually thinking about stuff in the built environment or whatever you want to call it is to me actually needs to be kind of central, especially because manufacturing is such a huge driver of environmental degradation. So we actually really need to talk and think about, yes, some of the big drivers like concrete, but also the things that all of us interact with on a daily basis that can help inform the way we think about some of those more abstract distant things like concrete. So the way I think about it is, um, you mentioned the sort of like, um, you know, Neanderthal, it was because I was in France at like a Neanderthal museum. Yeah. And it's actually goes both ways. Like some people who work on stuff, I feel like there's this thing of like, everything should be beautifully made and lasts forever. And yes, but actually I don't think that every object you own, you have to keep forever and commit to for the rest of your life. And you have to live in like a museum that looks like architectural digest and everything costs, you know, no, actually some things move into your life and move out of them. The key is that if they move into your life and into a, out of your life and into a landfill, that's the problem. <laughs> you have to share them with other people and build that circularity in. But I feel like we need to have the part of a healthy relationship is, is, as you said, an attachment and appreciation of the things around us on the one hand, objects that are well made that can last a long time, and an understanding that there can be a flow of objects through our homes and through our lives and back out into somebody else's home and life, and that that's part of it too. So it's kind of a um, it's like maybe to use the hunter, you know, the Neanderthal analogy, maybe that first rock, maybe there's one that works really well. And you hold on to that one. Everybody who's used any tool knows like, oh, that drill, I love that drill, it fits my hand. Versus sometimes you're like, ah, oh, I'll pick up whichever hammer they work, you know, like, so there can be a transience and there can be a holding on. But it, the key part of it is to recognize the value of these objects and the human labor that went into them. And that Either you keep it, you fix it for a long time, or you pass it on to somebody else. I just um, had Alan Moore on the podcast. He wrote a couple books, uh, Do Design and Do Build. I've, I've got them right here as well. And mm -hmm. um, in Do Build, she really talks about that as well. The, the, he talks, goes in specifically about different companies. One of them is an axe company that's very well built. And, and it's really about how we think how products are made and produced. And I mean, that's kind of an overarching theme and, and <clears throat> not only your book, but also the direction of thinking and circular economy that, that we need to go with humanity and to uh, repair, regeneration, restoration. Uh, how do we do that? And when, when we're, we, we detach that uh, that tool or that object from ourselves and we decide instead of going to the landfill, that we try to have it in a good condition to pass it on to someone else who can use it or in a way to recycle it as much as possible to get into another new product um, mm -hmm. that works. And, and that's what, you know, <clears throat> with the, the, the plastics that you brought up, I speak at a lot of food events and, and for me, the complex food systems is a lot about packaging and how we produce those and transport those goods and those uh, food products. And plastic for me is the the Frankenstein, the big evil. But it's only that because it's a pretty much a, a single use or cradle to grave type of uh, thought process. And if Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever, Nestle, they said, okay, every year or every day we produce, you know, um, 100 million metric tons of plastic and drink products that go out every day. But every single day, we clean up that same amount of 100 million, no matter if it's our products or not, as long as it's plastic, no matter what brand, what number, what level, we'll take that back. And we've found a new innovation to get it back into the cycle, to keep that in the flow so that it never ends up in our oceans and microplastics in our landfills. And that it's just continually in this organic or technical uh, uh, mm -hmm. circle closed system that doesn't come back to, to harm humans or our environment in any way. Well, and you know what's so funny is those, those, that's not new. 
like early oh, no. Coca-Cola, but was in glass and they collected the bottles and they refilled the Coke bottles or milk, you know, like the, yeah. the idea of sort of circularity and packaging. It's not even that far in the past. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's uh, it was pretty basic, but, you know, in the 19th and early 20th century to base to to basically do what Loop is doing, <laughs> refillable packaging. Yeah. Yeah, and I think somewhere we got off the, off the track because we um, started cheapening the way we did products. And whether it's mm -hmm. you cheapen food or you cheapen any product, you actually in return cheapen life because somewhere someone has to pay for that cheapening. They are not being paid a fair wage or there's mm -hmm. an environmental impact or then the way they're disposed of is a big impact and comes back to bite us. Um, so, and, and your book really talks about that many different aspects and, and that, but I want to, before, I, I want people to go out, I want them to buy your book, I want them to get the, uh, the, the uh, physical copy or digital if it's available and, and, and read it and really uh, consume it. So I don't want to give too much away, but I want to get into um, one one last aspect and i, I kind of caveat that with uh, an example that i had matter of fact it was just last week i spoke for a big european uh, uh company they're actually based out of uh, germany it's a big climate environmental hvac they do climate controls and heating and air conditionings refrigeration uh, it's called wiesmann and a fabulous uh five generation company that uh, is really trying to move in the right direction, circular economy, I think. Um, they have a big issue in Europe, especially, with um, people saying, okay, we've got this old Wiesmann boiler, or this old uh, way that's based on fossil fuels or coal or, or another type of kind of inefficient, very destructive and not up to date for infrastructural or, or this renewable transition, energy transition or this clean clean tech future. Uh, and we'd like to get people to that, but there, we just have people having trouble letting go of this old thing. So there, uh, in, in, your, in your book and in this whole uh, principle, I see two kind of different, there's definitely things that should be fixable, should be, kept in the cycle, but then there's some things that are still based on the industrial revolution and a very fossil fuel intensive way of producing, you know, plastics that take tons of oil and fossil fuels on and on. To make sure of it, how do you, uh, what are your thoughts or your feelings on this, this jump to a new type of a, a, a mm. transition or a new model of uh, getting us to the future where we need to be off of fossil fuels, off of oils, off of bad type of products that are this cradle to grave thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think the word you used is, is right, is transition. It's gonna be a slow process. Like we can't all right now, we shouldn't all right now run out and replace everything we've got with the new shiny, even if it's energy efficient model, like when, but when that thing is up for replacement because of the embodied carbon also in the new object, mm -hmm. um, but when that thing is up for replacement, that's when the opportunity in terms, of especially big things like HVAC and heating and cooling is to really make that decision right. You know, <laughs> like my building is actually considering it, we have to get a new boiler and it's a big expense. It's a big step. And this is the, you know, that's a minimum 10 year commitment. So that's like, those type of decisions are going to be big for individuals, for businesses, for buildings, for cities. How do we slowly transition out the old equipment for the new? One of the things that I think we really need to start talking about, though, is the way we build that new equipment. Like if you look at electric cars as a great example, we have to now with all these commitments in the United States and in Europe, we're talking about essentially transitioning our whole fleet of vehicles from combustion engines to electric vehicles, which is amazing and absolutely needs to happen. And, and nobody would have thought like four years ago that would be really seriously, you know, kind of having this conversation, at least in the United States. But what I'm not hearing as much is a really serious conversation about how we make that new fleet. What kind of circularity principles are we gonna use to not just make the new fleet 
with the old linear design and production systems. You hear it about batteries where people are like, oh, we have to make the batteries recyclable and this and that. What about the steel? What about the um, car, the seating material? What about the um, dashboard? The whole car, as we transition to this new fleet, should not only be energy efficient, but needs to be made with circular principles. And to me, that applies to like the whole bigger transition of objects like HVAC, like you said, cars, but actually everything. What we, we, what we have right now, I call it the fire hose of new stuff. We have a huge fire hose of brand new things, everything from like plastic bottles to cars to HVAC units being made with raw materials. And now we're talking about maybe making them better but that pipeline of raw materials needs to really, really, really over time diminish and transition a new sort of feed feedstock of reclaimed materials so that we're making those new cars and HVAC units and blenders and whatever with, with reclaimed materials. And that's a really tall order and it's gonna take a while, but I think we have to, we have to do it that way in order for it to be, um, not just about energy, but also about the material impact and labor, right? How are we making these things? How are we paying for people to make them? I, I got agree. really big, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that, that's where we need it. So in your book, you really talk about repair activism, the care economy, the circular economy, the stuff movement, um, the, the true differences between development and maintenance. Um, there are so many, not just nuggets of wisdom, but actually tools and, and ways to kind of see the world in a different way. And it's not one that really comes over as evangelizing sustainability. You, you don't come across as a tree hugger or an extreme extremist in that respect, but it's just the realities of nice, creative, beautiful design and ways to repair um, that can kind of change the way we look and see things to, to help us as individuals transition a lot easier, but maybe even nudge larger corporations and organizations to go in that direction of, of a different built environment, how we do things differently. Um, mm -hmm. you, you from Bernard College uh, 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 have some tools as well. The, um, and I'm gonna let you touch upon them because you know about them better than I do, but the Sustainable Production Toolkit, and you're, I think you're also working on Bernard Circular Campus uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing as well. Maybe you could tell us about some other tools and things. I mean, you you did pretty heavily this uh, whole repair movement, the shops, the pop-up stores, the markets and, and things as well. And so you've had that breath and it's, I don't know if it's still going on it, it, as much as it was, but I'd like to kind of uh, know about the new tools, what things you're working on, what's coming out. Uh, sure. Get us up to speed. So we, I paused the repair shops. I came to a point with the repair shops I was doing them, you know, I'm teaching at Barnard the whole time and still also designing for theater and running these repair shops. And I came to a point where I was like, what am I doing? You know, am I gonna be a repair shop owner or something? And I thought, you know, I could scale that way, like quit all my, quit my job and run these repair shops and fix every lamp in New York. And I realized that at a certain point, what I wanted to do was sort of like, scale the conversation in a way to say what are what what we learned about in these repair shops how does that apply to bigger questions of circularity how does that apply to what we're doing at barnard in terms of climate action and trying to build a, a circular campus as you said how does that apply to what i've been doing in theater all these years so i i thought i, I and i had the opportunity to write this book which is a big surprise for me so i i put the repair shops on hold and wrote the book in the hopes that, as you said, it would nudge or inspire other businesses, other communities to develop these kind of systems of circularity at all levels, big businesses like the Walmart, you know, and in fact, it's interesting, not because of my book, but like in 2020, Ikea committed to becoming fully circular by 2030, which is amazing. And when I started this project in 2013 would have been, um, you know, seemed very far-fetched. So the, it is happening. And I feel like um, for me, I've sort of 
trying to tell this story about consumption and repair, and then, as I said, apply it to theater, apply it to our campus. I love that. I, I, I am, and so there's the uh, sustainable production toolkit you're coming out as well. Oh and yeah, so that, so that is something I co-authored with a, um, some fellow uh, theater artists. We just did it over the pandemic summer. All the theaters shut down, and these are some um, you know fellow theater people who also have felt for many years that our industry needed to really address this, address climate change more seriously. Um, and at the same time that we were starting to put together the toolkit, we wanted to just make, basically make it easier because theaters have major sort of bandwidth issues. Nobody has extra staff to like do carbon accounting or extra money to, you know, put solar panels on the roof. Like it's really challenging for, for that particular industry, but we also felt like it's really important because A, we feel like every industry needs to tackle these things and B, um, we felt like cultural organizations and arts organizations have a role to play. And then at the same time, um, the kind of events of the summer of, you know, George Floyd protests erupted and there was this real reckoning with systemic races in American theater that had been there before, but really came to a head at this, in the summer. And so we're, we're trying also to help theaters see how, and this applies to the larger conversation of all of climate change, trying to make the case that working on climate response and working on um, social justice issues actually really go hand in hand. And it's not like, oh, now I have another big, really challenging item, but actually this work is related because I think the roots of inequality and, and racism and, and climate change in a way are they share, it's not one problem, but they share common roots in what you said before, which is extraction, extraction of labor, extraction of materials from the earth, and a sense of um, dominion or ownership that is not, not right and not serving people. So, so this, the toolkit is, a, like the book, is a series of really practical tips and tools for theaters to become more sustainable but hopefully also touching on some really deep questions of how do we do this work? How do we do this, make this transition in a way that is just and equitable, um, but also try to break it down. So it feels, it feels like accessible, a path that is possible. <laughs> Beautiful. I only have four more questions for you. And the first one is actually the hardest one that I'll have to ask you today. It's the burning question, WTF, and no, it's not the swear word that we've all been asking for the last 12 months um, or saying, it's really, what's the future? And I don't want to know for the U.S. or I want to know what's your vision of the future? For me or for the world? For you. What, what's your hope? What's your vision? Do you know what the roadmap and plan is? What's the future? It's funny you ask because just last night my husband and I were having a uh, sort of conversation you know if I think for anybody who really works on climate change and thinks about it all the time you tend to flip-flop between a sort of state of like horror and despair or avoidance or hope and I think um, you know there's definitely times when you look at the numbers and you think this is bad like this is bad a and b it's really bad and people aren't like jumping out of their skin to deal with it <laughs> so it's kind of two levels of of worry though things have gotten much better in this country with the change of administration but i guess for me the future is um i guess i'm a naturally hopeful person and i feel like i have work that i've cut out for myself to try to um, join this effort at Barnard, at Columbia, in theaters, in terms of circularity. And I feel like that is the work that I want to keep doing and that hopefully can, can help like in my little corner of the puzzle. Um, you know, I have children. I think anybody who has children, you look to the future and you're a little worried or a lot worried. And so I think 
you know, creating, it sounds so vague. How are we doing this? Creating a world where, where I feel like they'll be able to be healthy and happy. You know, for me, it's two things. One is the big, like trying to work on the macro problems and then two, working at home, you know, raise your kids, right? We bought a, a small piece of land upstate and we've been really trying to go there and, and um, use it as a place to kind of reconnect and figure out what we're doing and why we're doing this work it sounds mushy but it's a tough question <laughs> life is mushy i think that that's a, that's a great answer and actually ding 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 you got it right that was the right answer so um mm -hmm. i ask everyone that question i've asked uh, thousands of people that question and and um they're all different i don't think i've had to be the same um, a little to a little bit more to tell you how how and why I led you into that question is because um, if you ask people what's the future, uh, basically what's the plan for the future? What's our where are me where are we going? Where are we going to end up? Um, most people don't know, but to break it down very simple as it sounds, if we don't have a plan, a roadmap. Uh, a way to get there guaranteed someone else is going to deliver the future for us and we're not going to get there so the the your circularity the macro micro levels i, I think is a perfect plan uh, i'm a big sustainable development goal advocate the paris agreement i really think that's the world's first ever global moonshot we've ever had it's a historical precedence 192 countries for the first time ever in our history agreed upon something. If you know anything about countries or politicians or delegates, you're like, oh my God, that is the most unbelievable historical precedence ever because the, the politicians and delegates can't agree upon anything, let alone 192 on a roadmap or plan for the future. And yeah, we've almost were derailed and had some snafus and it's not looking as good as it can but it is a plan if we work at it chunk by chunk the, i guess the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time totally. uh, one to it slowly one bite at a time until you're done not that i advocate eating elephants <laughs> that reminds me the same conversation mike and i last night at dinner we were sort of he was sort of he was reading um uninhabitable earth or and he was so that book always makes people feel really, really worried and yeah. despairing and um and he, he was like saying, you know, it's capitalism, it's capitalism. And I was saying, I think, yeah, maybe, but I also think there's something deeper that is also a little bit of a ray of hope. Like I think kind of what got us into this mess is weirdly is our human capacity, right? Like, you know, a human from altruism isn't gonna save the planet. We saw that in my repair shops, right? neither is like a, a, a coyote or a rabbit. They're just gonna try to do the best they can for themselves. Well, the difference between the human and the rabbit is our, is our capacity to transform the world around us, to build collaborative societies, to work together, to imagine a different future. And so far that capacity has done amazing things and has also gotten us into a whole lot of trouble. But I do feel when I look at things like the Paris Agreement or the, the UN SDGs or some of the shifts that are happening now, I do feel like maybe that weakness, that sort of fatal flaw is also our strength. And maybe we do have the capacity to, to change and to rebuild our society intentionally. Um, because I always think that it works on an individual. I always think a person's strength is also their weakness and vice versa. And so maybe our weakness might just also be the strength that gets us out of it. I love it. And if throughout your book, and I have to say it again, I'm not, I'm not, you haven't paid me to say this. I love your book. <laughs> I see um, more, more so than I see circular economy principles or the, that, that it is a circular economy model. I see a regenerative economy model. And that's really something that's emerging. It will uh, progress and not only within the UN, but in within the world that more people are switching to regenerative business models, regenerative agriculture, economies, uh, regenerative capitalism, whatever you want to call it. It's a new way of operating within the safe spaces of our planetary boundaries. It's so and I new really that see it I don't there. even think we know what it means yet. Yeah, no, we don't. I agree. Absolutely not. 
I, I, it's almost like the, the, the beginnings of sustainability or the beginnings of corporate social responsibility, environmental uh, uh, social governance. What We're still grasping it. Well, I, I, I've spoken on it 17 times this year alone, regenerative uh, principles, practices, what it is. And every time they always think I'm going to talk about regenerative agriculture, uh, regenerative organics, because I come from a food background. But I, I want people to understand what the whole, it, it's a whole different operating system. You know, it's a whole different way of looking at the world and interacting. And so that's really what I see in your book, because I read it with a different lens, but it's beautiful. And I really recommend my listeners get it. The last three questions I have are really for my listeners. Um, if you were to give my listeners a, a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change and impact their lives, your message, what would it be? I guess my, mes my message to a listener is to take action where you are, right? Like where you are, where you're working, what you're thinking about is a piece of this system, is a piece of this puzzle and has value. And starting there, I think is incredibly powerful and important. So if you're a preschool teacher, do it in your preschool. If you're a mom at home, work on it at home and with your neighbors. If you're the head of a big company, do it there. But I really, I really feel like um, people should and could feel empowered to pick up this work of really imagining and building a, a regenerative, a sustainable future. And to feel like what every single person owns that, owns that work. Definitely. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about looking for ways to make real impact? So theater designers, educators, um, what should they be thinking about to make a real impact on the world? Well, I think theater designers really have an opportunity to push it in terms of circular design and production practices or regenerative design and production practices because theater is just a little petri dish. It's relatively small. We already have a really strong tradition of circularity. Um, we have a really huge push in the industry right now to think about uh, anti-racism and social justice. And designers and production people have a huge opportunity to kind of embody it, to make it real, to tell that story in the physical theater that we make. And then there's sort of no, it's not just words, it's right up there on stage. And so I think it's a, a great opportunity for theater makers. Is, is your sustainable production toolkit a nudge or a good thing to empower them to, to mm. take that journey or to take that step in the right direction? Hopefully, okay. yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, what have you experienced or learned so far in this crazy journey that you've had up until this point, uh, professional and just life, that you would have loved to know from the start? Hmm. Mm. I think this is something I still need to learn. I'm, I am <laughs> currently learning it, which is that... Um, I'm trying to learn to sort of, you know, over the past 10 years, I, 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 I took up a lot of work. I, I'm going to start these repair shops. I'm going to work on climate change. This is what I care the most about. I'm going to try to help transform the American theater and Barnard College and did all, all this stuff. And um, I'm trying to, to and, and, you know, that's like nothing compared to the work that some people are doing in the world. But I'm trying to learn to do that work with a kind of, lightness and joy and grace so that um because there's no reason to like <laughs> do it any other way and it's much better so that's my lesson that i'm working on right now and i guess i had wish i guess if i had thoroughly learned that lesson 20 years ago it'd be much easier right now but that's where i am <laughs> well that's yeah I, I always say i'm still on the journey so i'm still uh, still learning it uh, the journey is kind of the, the process sometimes um without that you wouldn't have learned those things but i love i love that response um 
Sandra, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas on the podcast and, and sharing your wisdoms and insights and your wonderful book and your time and, and giving us the, the, your personal thoughts and feelings on, on, on your view on how we can transition to better futures. I really thank you so much. And, and unless you have anything else you'd like to share with us, I'm done with, with my questions today. And I thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun talking. Thank you.